Welcome everyone to the Yogic Studies podcast. I'm your host, Seth Powell. This is episode 40. Today we have the pleasure of being joined by Dr. Kaylee Smith, who is an assistant professor in religious studies at Georgia College and State University in Milledgeville, Georgia. Kaylee, welcome to the podcast. How are we doing today? I'm doing pretty good, Seth. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. And you were just telling me this is a, a newly appointed position at Georgia College and State University. So congratulations on the position. Thank you. Uh, tell yeah. me just a little bit about it. Well, it's a new position, whole cloth. It was just uh, funded. It was just funded and um, by a generous donation from the Jane community. Um, so uh, yeah, so you know what I'll be teaching: nonviolence and religion in the fall, and mm. uh, things of that stripe. A lot of South Asian religious stuff, but no, no language stuff is associated with this position. So. Uh, you can imagine how excited I am to get one last shot to teach Vedic Sanskrit before that go. part of my brain is removed. Well, <laughs> maybe it won't be one last shot, um, but uh, yeah, that's very exciting. I'm glad um, glad we can offer that opportunity for you uh, and obviously for for our students to have you come and teach Vedic Sanskrit this summer. Uh, we're really excited to have you, to have you offer that, uh, and we'll get into more specifics about that course and what students can expect a little bit later in this conversation. But um, first, just to get us started, um, maybe just tell us a little bit about yourself, give us some background, tell us a little bit about the nature of your work uh, as a scholar of Vedic traditions. Uh, sure, yeah. Um, once upon a time, long, long ago, when I was just a tender undergraduate, I actually started off as a physics major. I wanted to do theoretical physics. And I sort of bounced around because I was really interested, I guess, in how the world worked. And what that meant started changing for me from sort of a materialist standpoint to a linguistic standpoint. What I mean is the way the world works is depends on who's perceiving it in a sense. And, you know, in, in the physics, in, the, in physics, you know, I think uh, probably the most famous version of that, the most Vedantic version of that idea of empiricism is Max Planck's. There's no getting behind consciousness. So I started getting into language and things like that. And so I ended up studying linguistics as an undergraduate. And then I did an MA in linguistics and I worked on Vedic stuff. And it was sort of a weird situation where Sanskrit teaching at my alma mater of the University of Georgia was pretty minimal. Uh, we did all the grammar in one semester. We read Epic in one semester and then immediately went on to Vedic. Why? That's because my former professor, Jared Klein, was a great linguist of Vedic. So and I where, always Where, approached where was that? Where, where did you do your undergrad? Jared Klein at the University of Georgia in Athens, Georgia. Oh, okay. Right there. Yeah. So, um, yeah. So, you know, I basically dove deep into Vedic from the get-go and uh, from a linguistic perspective. And for a long time, I thought, gosh, that's, I think, uh, studying language change, especially change within the Vedic texts themselves was so interesting. I thought that's kind of what I wanted to do. And then I realized I didn't really have anything meaningful to say about language change. If you are an aficionado of linguistics, that's great. Uh, if you're really mad about something in linguistics, you might actually have something to contribute. I did not have uh, a bone to pick. I thought that linguistics was really interesting, but what I was really interested in wasn't contributing to linguistics. It was better understanding these texts, these people, uh, this time period. And so that's why I ended up going to get my doctorate at Harvard University and working under Michael Witzel, um, where my, you know, it's ironic because... Uh, my statement of purpose when I entered said essentially, oh, I really would like to do a project using careful linguistic analysis to discover individual poet style in the Rig Veda and discover essentially some trace of authorship. And by the time I was mm -hmm. done with it, by the time I finished my dissertation, I had sort of viciously attacked that position. The idea that there were distinct linguistically identifiable authors in this collection was one I know that I didn't agree with anymore. And mm. a lot of what I wrote about in the fifth chapter of that dissertation was that 
these figures, these ideas of these ancient seers were clearly very important, not just to people, not just as cultural memories, but they were important in the performance of Vedic ritual, that these beings needed to be present at the ritual. And so instead of looking for historical figures, I shifted to start looking at, I guess I would say, the sense of memory and presence that was being produced by Vedic texts. So when I say produced, I mean in performance. And when I say Vedic texts, I'm using a very loosey-goosey term to refer to all kinds of texts that we associate with the Vedas, um, since it's really not proper to say any one text is this Veda or that Veda. We use that colloquially. We talk about the Rig Veda. The Rig Veda is not really one text. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I'll get into that in a moment. But essentially, that's what I started getting into. And I and my book that I'm that I've basically finished, but I have to fix all the parts that are wrong, <laughs> which is always a great stage to be at, um, looks at ritual impersonation of the god Indra, but also of the of the seven seers and other figures in Vedic ritual. Um, so that's kind of what's on the horizon right now, a book about impersonation. It's called The Invisible Mask. For what I feel are clever reasons, since it's verbal impersonation, it's a poem that asserts that you're this other being that transforms you. Uh, it's an inherently invisible mm. mask. Wow, fantastic. Well, I mean, there's so much there in what you just said, um, and a lot of nuggets I want to unpack throughout this conversation. Um, first, I was just thinking, it's amazing that you had Vedic Sanskrit as an undergrad, not many yeah. undergraduate institutions uh, offer something like that. Um, I was was the that only... a linguistics department? Was it a, a religion department? What, what, what was that? It was a linguistics program. We weren't a department yet. And mm-hmm. in fact, we never became a department. I think they might have been thinking about upgrading them to an institute, which is like between a department and a program. It has one funded arch professor. <laughs> um, but... A program essentially t- gets all of its instructions and all of its professors from other departments. So you might have someone from Complet, someone from uh, Classics. And Jared Klein is based in Classics. Mm-hmm. Um, but he taught he taught all the old Indo-European languages that I took as an undergraduate. Classical Armenian, uh, I, Comparative Greek and Latin, uh, Vedic Sanskrit. We even one summer studied Avestan together, which was fun. Um, mm. So, you know, we... We, because I also did an MA at the University of Georgia, we had a close working relationship of that sort. Um, and so you could dive directly into linguistics without. And then, of course, when I got to Harvard, I realized, oh, my gosh, I am not very good at classical Sanskrit. <laughs> hmm. um, so in some ways, I had the reverse process of education where I had these this Vedic skill set and I had to march forward with time and understand Mm, how do usage change how do semantics shift over time so wow yeah that's so um different from i think most people's experience where you're starting with classical sanskrit and that grammar and then maybe you'd work your way back to vedic if that's the direction that you choose to pursue yeah that's that's fascinating so although that 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 method rarely produces someone interested in going back to vedic hmm so <laughs> you uh, mentioned coming to Harvard and working with professor professor Michael Witzel. I mm. think if I'm not mistaken, maybe the first time we met uh, was in one of his seminars. Yes. On I have Indian a pretty good memory philology. of that moment. Um, we were looking at, we were discussing the Ashwamedha, the horse sacrifice. Yeah. Uh, and the, the possible, the possible sexual activity involved during that ritual. And, uh, you know whether we should uh, whether we should read the text with a hermeneutics of suspicion or a hermeneutics of respect. Um, in this case, actually, you know, it doesn't really matter which one you pick because we have these pretty explicit sutra literature that postdates the Vedas. But you know, you just, so you don't really need to uh, you don't really need to wonder mm. too hard. If you have these like pretty explicit sutra materials, somebody took it very seriously. Mm. Um, yeah, that, that 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 seminar with Witzel was was sort of a special uh, experience. Uh, there was only a few of us. Uh, I think by yeah. the end of it, it was really just me in, in you know in his office, sort of yeah. just hanging out and getting this sort of uh, just sort of like download of materials, basically from his encyclopedic brain. Yeah. 
I mean, um, and that's how that's how Michael is. He's kind of an empty Google bar. So my first semester at and you you just have to know exactly what to type in, right? So some right. people have trouble learning from Michael because they don't understand the right like Boolean me- search means. Mm. I would spend six hours every Thursday with him and we would just, we, we'd start reading something and then we'd come to some word that we couldn't like quite find what it was. And so we would go down some strange avenue looking through all these texts on botany or like, uh, you know, native flora and fauna of India trying to figure out what, what this thing might be. So you could really, you know, it was really a very old school uh, guru kulam method yeah. of of learning vedic philology yeah I, I i felt that very much um for for our listeners t- tell us just a little bit about witzel and his what you know what he's well known for and his contributions to indology well witzel's very famous you don't have to google <clears throat> too much to find uh the controversies that surround him i would say personality wise he's really like a german george carlin he's very snarky and but he's very funny yes. um you know, I remember he, I saw once he got a death threat from somebody who called him an animal. He was like, you are no more than an animal. And he said, yes, thank you. This is a good point. We are all animals. Like he <laughs> just, everything would just right off. Yeah. His, nothing phased yeah. him. Yeah. And um, why the, why is he getting death threats? Why are people calling him animals? Oh. Well, so um, Witzel, as well as many other scholars, was involved in the the California textbook case yeah. from the early 2000s, where uh, a group of um, Americans who were Hindu in in California objected to some of the representation of Hinduism uh, in their in textbooks. Mm-hmm. And I think some of those objections were quite valid, and others mm-hmm. were less valid. Um, mm-hmm. I could go into the details. Uh, I don't want to get too political, but like, I'll give you an example of one that I thought was an, a valid objection was the emphasis these textbooks had on the Varna system, that is the caste system, as being central to Hinduism, which is, uh-huh. I mean, I don't think anybody would say that that is the case for everyone that identifies as a Hindu. In fact, there's a strong caste critique in Hinduism too. So, I mean, these certain things were emphasized to exoticize the Hindu experience. And I think that many people who were upset were rightly upset. There were other things, however, that were less defensible. For instance, they objected to the claim the textbook made that the Mahabharata was composed before the Ramayana. Mm. Um, Because the events in the Ramayana are set before the events in the Mahabharata. Therefore, if these are historical, then one should come before the other. Mm -hmm. But if they're literary creations perhaps inspired by history, perhaps not, Mm -hmm. then we can't really date them based off of when they're set. Just to be a little flippant, I mean, I could write, uh, I could write a story about, you know, uh, young Jesus, for instance, and then say like, and and in fact, many, many young Jesus stories, the infant gospel of Jesus, these sorts of things uh, do exist, but they're considered non-canonical. Well, mm-hmm. I could do that and say, look, it, you know, this is about when Jesus was five and he had a skateboard. Mm-hmm. Therefore, this predates properly the Gospels themselves. So, I mean, I, I understand that that could be interpreted as flippantly. My, my point is it was a complicated debate. Witzel was one of the um, experts who was, among others, who was called on. And I think that got his attention. Or Sorry, that got, that made the mm-hmm. world. Yeah, it made uh, him a target. Made him a target. And then also there were several... Uh, he's also strongly associated with um, Aryan invasion theory or Aryan migration theory, the idea that Sanskrit speakers were once upon a time Proto-Indo-Europeans who entered the who entered the continent of India, mm-hmm. um, as opposed to the notion that Indo-European speakers originated in India and migrated mm-hmm. out from there. So he's mm-hmm. a, he was a strong proponent of Aryan migration theory. Uh, and what made him sort of famous in that regard is that somebody... Uh, said they, you know, one of the objections was like, "Look, the Indus Valley civilization does not know what the what the traditional horse is. There's no images of it." And um, then, of course, magically, suddenly they found a new Indus Valley seal that looked like a horse. And they said, "Aha! They do know what horses are. Therefore, Rig Veda, Indus Valley civilization is one civilization." Mm. And um, and Michael said something to the effect of, "This is actually the rhino seal with the horn photoshopped off." Mm. And then, 
and true to his sort of um, funny nature, uh, he called that article Harap and Horseplay. Mm-hmm. Um, so he he also with Steve Farmer uh, produced an analysis of the Indus Valley seals that argued that it was not actually a lost alphabet or some sort of language at all, but was some right. sort of, um, you know, the equivalent of iconography, uh, like one might see in a board game or on uh, signs or something like that, right. that they certainly meant something to the people, but it, they didn't represent syllables or uh, any particular one language. So if you want the Indus Valley civilization to be a Sanskrit speaking civilization, that's a big problem for you. So that I sort of, I think, sort of drew um uh, uh attention to him negative for, for many years farmer and witzel they had like a running bounty like yes. something like five or ten thousand dollars if you could definitively prove yeah. them to be wrong that yeah that in fact the indus valley seals do express some sort of language yeah um that they would reward you with this bounty yeah i would always uh, tell my students know, those that. are the kinds of theatrics that i think um i love michael but I think on some level he thrives on. He's no, he's not afraid yeah. of drama. Whereas I'm a very spineless and I'm always trying to find some sort of middle ground. <laughs> mm. um, so not spiny like, like Michael. Um, yeah. I, I generally think that it's just not productive. I can tell you why I believe in some sort of migration into India theory. And it's not complicated at all. Um, sure. Can I share my screen? This will take five seconds. Yeah. 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 Let's go for it. Yeah, I wasn't planning to take us in this direction, but we're here. Let's let's. Well, you know, I I just want to because when there's new evidence, I change my mind. But this mm-hmm. is the current evidence that I think is very persuasive and hard to um, hard to easily rebuke. So yeah. it's kind of like my current like nugget where I'm like, uh, find a more compelling theory. And of just this. to be clear, the reason why this question of origins is very significant and is highly controversial and politicized mm-hmm. today is because we're talking about whether these Sanskritic traditions originated in the land that is indigenous to the Indian subcontinent, or whether they were brought from outside by Sanskrit-speaking peoples that then migrated in. And I mean, the truth is, it's it's not so black and white. The Sanskritic tradition, yeah. of course, originated in India as far back as we can measure. The question is, did those did the speakers who were the ancestors of the Sanskritic tradition, were they biologically Indian or were they biologically Mm. migrants? And why Mm. is that important? It's only important if you plan on demonizing migrants, right? It's if you want to, if it's hard to be xenophobic, if it turns out you're, well, I would say it's hard to be xenophobic if it turns out you're a a nation of immigrants. But on the other hand, (laughs) um, so, you know, I mean, that's what's at stake, right? If you want to, how how far back can you extend your nationalism if you are trying to say some people belong here and some people don't? Well, but it's a silly question anyway because all so the you gra- should you should be able to share your screen now. Uh, if you, if all you the want. great all, all many of the, the the great literary achievements of Sanskrit, of course, happened in um, in India itself, right? But how does that connect to people today? Uh, who are they reading them? If they are, then we can talk about them. Uh, okay, so here's the simple thing that I think is a pretty persuasive argument for why um, Indo-European, at least, is unlikely to have derived from Sanskrit, right? This is the the strongest case of the theory. Sanskrit is the origin language of other Indo-European languages like English, Greek, Latin, etc. Well, Sanskrit has this nice third, perf, uh, third person, um, oh, will I be able to, uh, dar... There we go. Uh, third person, singular, um, perfect, the darsha from the root drish to see. And this means essentially like he or she has seen. Um, it also, by the way, means I have seen because there's a first person, singular, perfect, that looks exactly like the darsha for reasons that we'll explore in Vedic. This is actually one of the differences in Vedic grammar is sometimes first and third singular perfects are different. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's your Sanskrit form. All right. In Greek, you've got de dorke. 
And actually, let me use the first singular. I'm going to use the first singular I have seen. And the reason I want to use the first singular I have seen is because in Greek, the first singular is de dorka. Okay. Okay. So similarly, first singular perfect I have seen. Idem. Now, here's the, here's the trick. If Greek is derived from Sanskrit, you have a problem. Because how does this a uh know to become an e? Eh? But this a uh know how to become an o. Mm. And then this a uh knows how to stay an a. Uh, right? Sounds aren't sentient. Well, some people would disagree, but at least in terms of modern linguistics, we don't ascribe agency to the word once it's out of your mouth. How does this happen? In fact, it doesn't. It's never observed in natural language because what that would be called is an unconditioned split. So for a sound a uh, to become e eh or o oh or a, ah, that can happen, but it happens in specific environments conditioned by its its particular um by its particular uh, uh by the particular conditions. For example, if you take Spanish what would have been an underlying form dedos, the way it's pronounced in Spanish is dedos as a fricative, dedos, and I don't have the mm -hmm. IPA character ready, so I'm just going to use a capital D, mm -hmm. dedos, right? But why do you pronounce it the instead of the there? Because it's between vowels, that's intervocalic position. On the other hand, this de stays a de because it's at the beginning of a word. So that would be a case of a condition split. Different conditions change the sound in different ways. This, however, would be an unconditioned split if Greek de Dorka was derived directly from Sanskrit. Mm -hmm. But notice there's another twist here because you can't derive Sanskrit. Um, well, actually, you could you could in principle derive Sanskrit de Darsha from Greek de Dorka, but there's other reasons you don't want to do that. The simple point is an unconditioned split never happens in human language that we've seen. And the reason is really the second law of thermodynamics. That is, information can't come out of nowhere. You can get information, but you need to do work on it. Sound change, as it goes from phase to phase in an unconditioned manner, reduces information. It cannot create information. So de dorka can lose distinctiveness between e, o, and a by becoming a, a, and a, but it can't create distinctiveness out of nowhere, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You could create distinctiveness, but that's another process called analogy. So when I have a word brother in English and the plural is brethren, and then suddenly brethren doesn't really look like a good plural for brother, I can invent a new form brothers by extending another plural, uh, you know, fruit fruits to brother to make a new brothers. And then I'll keep brethren as some specialized form. But the point there is, those kinds of changes are a whole other realm of linguistic change called analogy. This sound change, you don't see unconditioned split because language is an entropic system and it tends towards entropy until speakers do work on it through analogy. That's why we have Sanskrit words like trida, heart, but then this becomes um, harga in a middle Indic dialect. And by the time you get to, a, a, you know, like an upper Brahmsha, you've got something like ha'a with just a, a pause. Or um, now what that sounds fine. But what if you had a word like mriga and you had a word like mrita. So one is uh, this is deer. And then this is going to be dead. Well, if that same sound ch <laughs> change happens, you would get oops, you would get um, You'd get something like, uh, uh, well, you'd get something like ma'a as the output here. This, of course, would pass through a phase of maga, but then it would also be ma'a. So the same sound changes of losing r and then the loss of a consonant between vowels, which are regular sound change happening on the way to Middle Indic and Upper Brahmsha, would force these two words to fall together and become indistinct. That's mm. the kind of erosive effect of sound change over time. But it gets repaired through analogy when we just use new words or use compound words to specify things like that. So anyway, that you know that was a long-winded way of of looking at these two words that are the same. But it strongly suggests that Greek and Sanskrit have a common origin. But Sanskrit cannot right. be the origin of of Greeks insofar as we understand the way the second law of thermodynamics applies to language. Uh, and if someone can give me a better explanation of that then I would 
reconsider mm -hmm. migration mm -hmm. theory, but no one has yet. Mm. So just to clarify there, you're not saying that there's no relationship between the two. There clearly is, but mm -hmm. that based on this example and many others, Sanskrit cannot be argued as the origins point for languages right. like Greek, but rather both as Indo-European languages, um, there is likely to be some common source. Is that and is that what is considered proto-Indo-European, or is that something That's right. else? That's so, right. And so, interestingly enough, although the, you know the origin of proto-Indo-European is, of course, it's whole a whole other hotly debated topic. With mm. I would say the majority uh, of people putting it, you know, north of the Black and the Caspian Seas, a, a second large group. Uh, wanting it to be located in Anatolia and modern day Turkey. Um, interestingly enough, and this is sort of telling, um, the Indian academic nationalist camp doesn't really care that much about Indo-Europeans origins. They, the, the idea that Indo-European began in India would be an argument that would be a much easier argument to make, mm -hmm. linguistically speaking, than, right. than uh, Indo-European languages are derived mm -hmm. from Sanskrit. Right. If you were to say, hey, Indo-European was what they spoke in Harappa, then uh, a bunch of people migrated out and became whatever language. And then some people who stayed in Harappa uh, after many thousands of years developed the language of Sanskrit. That's a much more defensible sure. premise. But that's not really the, the argument that people are interested in. The argument has to be that Sanskrit, Sanskrit is, is the, the mother origin. of all languages, right? It can't be a sister. It has to be a mother. Um, so, you yeah. know. Fascinating. Well, again, this was, uh, wasn't planning to go in this direction, but I'm glad, I'm glad we did um, because it's great to get, you know, um, your, your clear, sober kind of overview of that. And, and I appreciate what you're saying is like, look, this is the available evidence as I can see it. And if new evidence comes to light, then we should adapt and, and change, you know. Now I don't have to talk about it during the course, which is great. Clear the air. <laughs> there you go. Okay. Well, let's um, let's get back to uh, w once there is a Sanskrit tradition, uh, mm -hmm. and let's talk a little bit about the Vedas. What are the Vedas, Kaylee? Oh boy. Um, well, as 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 you might have seen in a dictionary, Veda means knowledge, and so that's what's so interesting when we talk about a Rig Veda or a Tarva Veda or a Sama Veda. We often think we're referring to a specific text. But that's not quite exactly right. Veda is like an idea of a text. It's like a, a bag of textuality into which a certain kind of text will go. So when I, we colloquially refer to the Rig Veda, 99% of the time we're really talking about the Shakalya Samhita, which is the 1,028 hymns associated with the Rig Veda mm. all together in Sandhi. We might be talking about the the Shakalya Padapata, which is that same text out of Sunday. Now, why in the world would they have both? Well, because these texts, and this might help us understand why Veda sort of refers to a domain of textual type rather than specific text. This is all in the realm of orally produced texts that were memorized and transmitted from body to body, from master to student for a long, long time. I think I would estimate 3,000 years. But, you know, some people are want to want to push that date out. So other people want to pull that date in. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's Im important to show a, a good humble, humble skepticism with uh, uh, too much date modification. There's good reasons to sort of push, put, I think there are good reasons for dating the Vedas as quite old. There are also some reasons that aren't so good. Um, nevertheless, when we talk about the Vedas, we're talking about a canonical group of texts that today many people take as authorless, eternal, and, and, and emanating from the very first syllable at the beginning of the universe, the syllable Om. In fact, um, that hasn't always been the opinion. Uh, mm -hmm. That was an opinion that emerged in certain uh, Mimamsa circles in the early classical period, uh, and it was disagreed with by other Sanskrit language schools of philosophy like Nyaya, who were like, no, just some guys did it. And of course, by what are called heterodox groups like Buddhists. Um, so <clears throat> these are 
sort of big oceans of texts. We could think of them that way, but of oral texts. They are canons of texts uh, because of their subdivision. Essentially, the idea of the Vedas in a very, let's say, uh, sociological sense started when different kinds of ritual labor were assigned to different groups of people exclusively. So if you're a Rig Vedan, you're going to be reciting poems from the Shakalya Samhita. Mm. You will also learn, after you've mastered your Samhita, if we're talking about the Vedic period or the late Vedic period, you'll also learn certain extra texts like a Brahmana, for instance, the Aitareya Brahmana, which is a commentary. It was not the performative utterances, those are the Samhitas, that you actually did to do the rituals, but they sort of uh, justified this or that ritual action during that, during ritual performance. So the, in broad strokes, when we think of the four Vedas, we are thinking about the oldest text being essentially song books used in the performance of certain rituals. What those rituals did, we can talk about later, and ancillary texts that comment on them. And those are the sum total of what's in the Vedas, in essence. Uh, there are also Vedangas. These things do proper pronunciation. They are focused on proper mathematics of the ritual ground, etc. Um, but properly speaking, already in uh, already at least in the second century BCE, there was a division between what was considered the Vedas, that is, what's Shruti, what's revealed, and what had human authors. Mm-hmm. Um, Talk and so, a little bit about on the on that note. You mm-hmm. know, how do we? Th- what comes to mind for you when we when we say Vedic texts? When we think of this corpus as sacred text or mm-hmm. scripture, are they poems? Are they hymns? Is it literature? Is it ritual? Um, liturgy? How how? What are some of the strengths and weaknesses of trying to categorize this this mm. body of material that, as you said, was originally oral and yeah. then only later composed and, and, and written down? In some ways, it's all that and more. Uh, and I think we should all be very hesitant to assign kind of a genre to a Vedic text. And the reason is, uh, for this reason, the Vedic peoples didn't have the relationship I have to a book where I can like read it throw it down, pick it up later, right? Mm -hmm. It's this external, you know, they would see us in a way as cyborgs, right? We're able to take a piece of the mind and put it in paper. That's a a stretch of 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 an image, but, you know, that kind of relationship we have to textuality, to writing, to documents, is a relationship of a living person who has total ownership and command of a dead thing. Well, let alone today with the digitization, now I'm thinking of mind in... But what computer. if you could only ever learn something or you could only ever find out something from a living person? And I don't mean like, oh, I discovered this land. The land is, I mean, the Vedas were always taught from a living person to a living person. There's a relationship. When you hear a recitation and you want to learn that recitation, you're going to imitate the voice of who recited it to you. And that person, when they were young, is was imitating the voice of the person that recited it to them. So there's a long tradition of, mimesis of embodiment of texts and what makes this in a sense special is it disrupts that kind of the possibility that a text could be a dead thing we have to honor the possibility that texts bear something more than just information they bear this kind of animacy they they bear the the energy of everyone who's put their their life into memorizing and and you know vocalizing and uh and so when I say it's all that and more, I mean, we could divide, we could transform the Vedas into the dead texts of written on a page. And we will do that to read it because that's how we do it. That's the only real solution, I think, to looking at the language of the Vedas uh, in this day and age where we're not trained. We, we can't spend 20 years listening. Um, I mean, I guess I could. But, um, but what I mean is that these texts were also not just passed down for their own sake right? They were used. They were used in ceremonies. So if you were to say, hey, is the Vedas poetry? Is it a ritual handbook? Is it a philosophical uh, speculation? What What is it? I would say something to you like, well, what's Memorial Day, right? If you go to a Memorial Day event, you're going to see lots of solemn words that are not poems. There's probably going to be someone who sings a song. 
There's probably going to be some speechification. There's going to be the communal sharing of food. It's a whole event that does, really defies one genre. And mm. that's exactly what the Vedas were used for. There was a time and place when the Vedic peoples, in a sense, were free peoples. They were freer than we could ever imagine. In, and I mean in that sense that they had a vastly different relationship to the relationship we have to the idea of law. They lived a very seasonal existence. The rules that governed how they lived, the, the, the behaviors they had, shifted with time. It shifted with political relationships. And these and the Vedas were used in public ceremonies that allowed them to, as a group, reimagine and redefine those political relationships. But they didn't have an eternal thing like the idea of a government. They didn't have, I mean, in a sense, the Vedas are kind of like a constitution. Hmm. Um, but th the point I'm trying to get at is that we the Vedas are inventive. They're an active truth in that they are acted upon. And a group of people use the Vedas to think about their own past, their own antiquity, in order to find out what kind of relationships they should have going forward, even if going forward is just for a season or a year. That's the power of the Vedas as a social tool for, for mediation between, between Vish or clans. That's what the Vedas were created for. That's what they do. Um, when political relations changed at the end, what we think of as at the end of the Vedic period is the rise of urban culture again in the Gangetic plain. What rises with that urban culture are also inherited monarchies, something which was very foreign to the Vedas. I mean, you see a little bit of that already in the Mahabharata, which is like a love letter to the Vedic period in a sense, where they say, oh, you know, way back in the day, a king would simply pick whoever was the best to be his successor. They didn't just, his, his baby child wouldn't inherit the kingdom because what kind of baby child would be fit to be crowned prince? So there's already this kind of wistful memory of another way of creating political relations and um, and political linearity and genealogy. Um, the Vedas are very much in that pre-inherited monarchical world. And when they collide with that monarchical world, their use and relationship changes. And in many ways, I think that's still something we don't really understand. I mean, we don't understand it. We don't understand the period when this these were sort of documents of government and the period when the way that small polities and ultimately what we, you know, ultimately uh, Mahajanapadas worked no longer depended on the Vedas to renew those that social compact. Instead, they had a very different idea of sovereignty. What role did the Vedas take after that seems to have changed a great deal. Um, and that's something that as I'm very interested in in my research. Uh, I still don't know if we've really asked the right questions of that history. For most Hindus today, the Vedas are taken as primary scriptures for their tradition, for their faith. The Vedas are seen as divinely revealed or inspired by the rishis or seers and that the the knowledge um, and the contents of the vedas are seen as eternal um, and and again divinely revealed how, how are we to understand that how do you understand that as a scholar of this corpus of these traditions uh, and what can we say about authorship and what what does that mean for a text to be seen or revealed by a rishi mm -hmm. who were these rishis what wh why are they important you know to this grouping of, of, of texts um yeah what what thoughts can you share with us about authorship i know as you mentioned this is a question that you've pursued quite a bit um i mean in a sense there's three answers answer one is thinking of the vedas as timeless and eternal makes perfect sense to me because if you grew up in a Vedic family, from the minute you were born, you would hear the constant rolling thunder of recitation of the syllables of the Vedas. It would You would be born into them and you would die hearing that in the background, that chanting all the time. Um, from your perspective, in terms of your consciousness, it's an eternal thing. And all the way back to the Jaimini Sutras, um, Frank Clooney has written about this, the second century BCE is when we generally date them, Already, the idea of the rishis are not as 
poet creators, but rather no different than the people, the Vedic peoples who are transmitting the Vedas to this day. They were just the first ones to receive and transmit it. Um, but we also have lots of contemporary accounts that disagree with that understanding of the Vedas. So how in the world do we get from timeless and eternal Vedas to this idea that there was a Vedic period and we have older Vedic texts and less old Vedic texts and then the youngest Vedic? And that all comes from the late 19th century. Um, Orientalists had recently, uh, or linguists had recently discovered the exceptionlessness of sound law. That is, as I talked about, you know, when a sound loss earlier, when a sound loss sweeps through a language, it does so um, with rare exception, exceptionlessly. <laughs> that is, once upon a time, English had a trilled R. And we'd say things like, uh, farmar. <laughs> Then all those R's, no matter what their position in the language, change to the er we have today, uh, except on certain, except in places like Scotland, where the trilled R uh, remains because it was outside of that area where mm. all the R's shifted. That's what I mean when I say exceptionlessness of sound law. So by looking at the way that sound law changed in a subconscious way, not something that people do on purpose, late 19th century scholars were able to date the Vedas. They also looked at other features like grammar. Yes, the Vedas are artificially archaizing. What I mean by that is, just like any poetry, uh, it looks back on its predecessors and often imitates. So a poet might imitate an older poet, and that's going to make his or her language seem older just by that act of imitation. I would say all language is a little like that. But um, so there's the two camps. You've got timeless and eternal Vedas. Vedic period with a slow accretion of text. I would say there's a third way forward, which is let's just see what the Vedas have to say. And what mm. you'll find is the Vedas, these texts have lots of origins for themselves. That's what's so great. So evidently on some level, they were able to do what a lot of people can't do anymore, which is accept the possibility of multiple origins, of multiple stories, of multiple ways. So we're going to look in this course at like three or four origin stories for the Vedas, starting with the most traditional one, which is from the Jaimini Upanishad Brahmana, where the Vedas come from the syllable Om. But we're going to mm -hmm. see some other possibilities of where these things come from in the texts themselves. Now, the texts themselves likely come from different dates, but in a sense, it doesn't matter because if the Vedas were timeless and eternal, then we can say they timelessly and, and eternally accepted the possibilities of multiple narratives about themselves. And that's really interesting. It's, you know, I, I feel like today people really love canons. They get really mad when perhaps like a certain intellectual property produce is produced in a show and they don't feel like it matches up to their idea of what that canon character is. Maybe they are mad about She-Hulk or maybe they're mad about, I don't know, whatever. It doesn't matter. We have this notion of like fandom ownership and canonicity that comes from this long, weird history that goes all the way back to Martian, the guy who first came up with the idea for the New Testament as a canon. And by the way, that guy was like, most of these Paul letters are fake uh, and only the gospel of Luke is real. Right. Mm -hmm. So he was the first guy to say, like, only this stuff, everything else. No. And we're at the other end of that history with only my version of She-Hulk can be She-Hulk. Well, in the Vedas, they weren't... The Vedas did not have the same form of toxic fandom, evidently, that we see today. So the possibility of multiple stories about them is very much accepted. And I would hope that as we read the text together, we'll open ourselves to multiple possibilities. I think that's the scholarly way, too, personally. That's interesting that you say that about the, the kind of flexibility of canon within the Vedas. And yet at some point, there were lines that were drawn. There is sort of certain institutionalizations and orthodoxies, if you will, that did draw lines of tradition. Um, I'm wondering, um, but, I mean, moving here's forward... The thing is, sorry, yeah. no, no, those texts, ahead. they keep making texts. Right. And people keep arrogating to themselves, by which I mean claiming that this is Vedic stuff. I'm right? thinking so, of Upanishads in particular. Yeah. I mean, those throughout the centuries never stopped. Yeah. 
And, you know, but I, but I imagine some like the scholars, Mahabharata, the Bhagavata Purana, they say things like this is really the fifth Veda, right? Yeah. So it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a space for sacred text that always appears to be closed, but is always, always a little bit open. <laughs> but would like Nambudri Brahmins in Kerala, would they accept those later texts? I mean, it wouldn't be a part of their tradition, right? No, no. Because what they would accept for the purposes of recitation is what they learned as children. So in that sense, it can be very, very, I mean, it is very conservative. Yeah. Especially Nambudri Brahmins. Yeah. Because they're the last uh, Vedans that are, they're a hundred percent off book. Right. Right. That's I mean, they amazing. Need yeah. <laughs> Did you, you had a chance to go to India with Witzel and a group from Harvard, right? For a That's recreation right. of an, was it an Agni Chayana ceremony? It was, oh, it was even better. It was an Atiratra, which is like an Agni Chayana on, on, on no dose and, uh, and jolt cola. And an Atiratra is a, um, it's a, it's the 12 day version of the Agni China, same big fire bird altar, but at the end, it's got this 1000 verse overnight recitation. It goes, uh, to the dawn and to the Ashvins. Um, and, uh, it's very impressive, um, and very long. And, um, was, and Finian, of, was Finian Garrity there? Yeah, Finian was there. Well? Uh, I remember him interviewing at the very end of the ritual. You know, there was some ups, there were some people upset because halfway through the twelve days, there had been some light rain, yeah. and people were really expecting rain only at the end of the ritual. Right? right. This was the this was the delivery. So, like, even though rain is something you want, the fact that it came too early, mm. there was tea shop talk that something was wrong with these priests. They were eating fish on the sly or something like that. Mm. But Finn, I remember, interviewed the Udgathar, the head Samavadin, at the very end of the ritual. At the very end of the ritual, you know, suddenly the sky cracked in the final moments when they're about to set everything on fire. Because at the end of this particular ritual, you burn everything down. Uh, and then these, you know, arrows of cold rain shot through the, through the sky and just flooded everything. And, you know, so people got what they wanted. We were right. all running around in the rain and in the fire. Uh and people were running up to me asking me if I felt the Yaga effect. And of course I did feel it. I mean, everyone yeah. felt it there. Yeah. It was it was dangerous. There had been some scientists there who wanted to study the properties of sacred fire who didn't go to that last day because they feared it was too dangerous. It was a swirling vortex of people feeling the Yaga effect. And Finn asked the Udgatar how he felt. And he said, I feel powerful. Um, so, you know, one of those had to be their moments. But after all this time and dedication to very precise things to have such a dramatic finale uh you know you'd be hard pressed to feel nothing just say a few words uh, what's what's so significant about this atiratra ceremony and, and it being done today in you know in or I, I don't know when that was a few years well, back well in principle but... it hadn't been done since 1975 um, and that was, the, Vedic, that was when Fritz Stahl and his crew went right. out and created that That's doc right. And that's something your students can fire. watch if they haven't already. It's on YouTube. It's 45-minute yeah. documentary. Yeah. Um, uh, and prior to that, though, it hadn't been done for quite a while, right? Yeah. Well, and specifically, it hadn't been done there in Panyal, in Kerala. Now, if you walk through Panyal, you'll see the old sites of ancient fire altars some the most dramatic one has a tree growing through the middle of it because it's from like 1901 it's a very old yeah. uh, i think that's right and in the nambudaris are the most archaic vedic tradition that still exists because they're completely off book but they only really do two big shrauta rituals the two big rituals they do is the, they do a, the uh, the agni stoma and then the Agni China at the retra, that is the at the retra form of the Agni China. So it's those two things. And you can't do the second one until you've done the first one. So there's a lot of, and you can't do the first one until you're at Ahitagni. So, I mean, there are a lot of preconditions to doing one of these big things. It's also extremely expensive because it yeah. takes so long. You have to have all this food prepared. It will draw onlookers. Onlookers need to be fed. And, um, it, you know, it, it, it becomes an event of thousands of people. And, um, that was another thing people were curious about. Where did all the money come from? And it seemed to come from a trust that was based in Qatar. And so many people speculated uh, about what that meant. Um, 
I never got any real answers because uh, people have to speculate. But mm-hmm. um, you know, it was it was it's a rare event. Um, now, probably it, it happens more than we'd think, but I don't think it had. At least it had been on the down low until 2011, and then when 2011 mm-hmm. happened, people realized there was a, a significant amount of tourism possible for this, mm-hmm. right? Sure. Because most of the many people were not. I mean, Panyal is not a big village. Uh, so a lot of people were drawn there were probably, I mean, tourists from all over India that wanted to see this, this, what was called a 3000 year old Vedic rite. I mean, I would, I would probably call it a 2500 year old Vedic rite personally. Uh, But still, we're talking about one of the most ancient human rites that's, you know, maybe there's some adaptations, you know, obviously a few changes and things, but by and large, they're doing the same thing that they would have done over 2000 years ago. That's right. Something that was, you know, (laughs) that was uh, already, you know, 1500, 1500 years old when some guy was coming up with Beowulf, right? I mean, like, Mm, yeah. That's incredible. Old stuff. Old and stuff. Finn, Finn, and again Finn and produced again. that short film, uh, Mantras to the Max, which, and so that footage must have been from, from that event. Is that right? Uh, I mean, it could be, but Finn has gone back yeah. and has a good, yeah. close relationship with the Nambudri community. Whereas I'm more of a dusty textbook scholar. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. I think I'm, I'm not, not really great just to talking to, people I know and in my own family. So let alone being like a, <laughs> a, a savvy anthropologist who, you know, whatever. I, oh, uh, come on. Everyone has different strengths. And uh, books, I think you, I think you can nice talk to, to, you can talk to just about anybody about anything uh, is my, my experience with you, but oh, Hey, really? let's, let's, let's shift gears. I'm sure a lot of people listening who are thinking about this course are thinking about, uh, they want to hear a little bit about Vedic Sanskrit. So, Tell us a little bit, um, you know, we'll get into what you're going to teach in the course, but just to get us going there, you know, as we said, most people are probably more familiar with classical Sanskrit and yeah. then kind of moving back. So especially for folks who maybe have studied a little bit of Pananian classical Sanskrit, mm-hmm. just what are, in your mind, some of the key differences between classical Sanskrit and Vedic Sanskrit? Probably the most striking one is something that in in the Greek tradition they call tamesis, although it's not really properly tamesis because tamesis means cutting. The idea that you can cut a preverb off of a verb. It's more likely the case that uh, the preverb was never attached in any firm or fixed manner in our Vedic texts. That is, very often a Vedic sentence or verse will begin with the preverb and end with the verb. I don't know, I should reverse this. Begin with a preverb and end with a verb. And then what is syntactically construed with the verb is interior to that construction. So you might have pra dot 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 the rest of the sentence. And at the end, some nice, beautiful aorist like got. (laughs) Um, And you get to construe that um, because I guess the closest thing is, imagine if you as an English speaker had heard words like, uh, don't upset her. But then you'd never heard anyone say, don't set me up. And then you thought, don't set me up. Is that the same thing as upset? Or is Mm -hmm. it something different? Is to set someone up different than to up someone set, right? So in the Vedas, because of the fluidity of the preverb, we're left often wondering, Mm. is the sense a very, um, is it a very physical sense to up? set someone is it a metaphorical sense or is it something that is derived on some second order metaphor right so you know what are what are the idiomatic senses of these verbs sometimes a verb clearly has already fused with its preverb and then you might get another preverb that's detached from it so there's lots of stuff like that the verb is extremely expressive in sanskrit in the ways that uh Classical Sanskrit is very expressive, but it does so often by means other than the verb. Um, so, for instance, all the aspects have real concrete meanings for in Rigvedic poetry. Uh, they're not just stems you learn. Panini will tell you, oh, the aorist is when something happened earlier that day. The imperfect is when something happened earlier, but it was before today. And the perfect is something that happened beyond your own memory, right? Well, 
that's not entirely so. In fact, it's very different in Vedic. It seems like in Vedic, it's almost wrong to think of the verb as having really a distinct tense. Rather, what aspect is, is the present stem, and it's imperfect, is the default. Shut up, cat. Is the default aspect. It's not specified for terms of how the action is carried out. But the aorist certainly implies an action that is immediate. I'm going to let this cat out. Oh, I, I can't hear it at all. Oh, you can't hear the cat? Okay. No, well, no, not at all. Was... Not at all. So um, no, no, no problem the, here. The, cats the, cats are always air, welcome at yogic studies too, by the way. The, the aorist is a, is, a, is a verb that reflects an already an action that has already been completed and in the sense that it started and completed the difference between like, you know, um, if I said the cheese melts, um, I'm not saying that the cheese is in a process of melting, right? It's now once the melting happens, it's done. Mm. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So similarly, uh, perfects are kind of a fusion of the present and that heiress. They are, a result that is the culmination of a process. So we know the root gum is like to go, right? Mm. But if I said jagama in in Vedic, this would not mean I went. It would mean I have arrived because the the culmination, the result of a process of going has concluded with my finishing that going. That is my arrival. Mm. So if I said a ah, jagama, that I, that's just, I, I am arrived. It's not a past tense. If I wanted it to be, I had arrived, I would need to make a past tense to that perfect. That's a pluperfect. That's something that Vedas do. Mm. So it's just a much bigger verbal system with a lot more options in it. Um, and the verb is very important. What about uh, um, one of the things you hear most commonly that Vedic has that classical um, dropped or or no longer carried forth is is accent or sometimes referred to as tone or pitch. Um, yeah, tell us a little yeah. bit about that. And and you also and you see that represented both in the Devanagari. You know, once this was committed to writing, um, with those sort of diacritic marks above the the characters, as well as in transliteration. Yeah, the the accent is important. Um, because sometimes it's the only way to solve some of the grammar. So it's not just that different words sounded different. They often have grammatical consequences. So for instance, um, da, 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 I'm going to share my screen and give you just a quick example. Sure, great. Um, need to turn this in. All right, so these are two different words in Vedic because the accent is different. This mm. is the neuter noun, yeshis, and it really means something like worth. Sometimes that's translated as fame, but I, I, I think that's actually a, a little off. I think it, it means worth. Whereas this is an adjective that means worthy. So whereas yeshis is always going to be a neuter noun, yeshis is going to modify some guy. So if I said, oh, look at this guy, he's... Oh, it's not the symbol I want. Uh, you know, I don't actually have a diacritic at the ready right now for long A. So I'm going to use capital A. I'm going to use capital H for my Visarga. If you said this guy's Yeshaha, that would be the nominative singular adjective, masculine adjective for someone who is worthy. Okay? You would never see this form in any of the iterations of, um, of a neuter noun worth. And you would know this because, because of the accent. Um, similarly, brah, oh, that's something. Brahman is a neuter noun, man stem. So you get brahma in the nominative accusative singular, but brahma, brah, oh, brahman is the masculine noun. This is a, this is a speech act, a poetic composition. Uh, we could, the brahman might be the Rigvedic poem. The Brahman is the person who formulated that. And so sometimes it's translated as composer or formulator, sometimes just as priest. Mm. Um, although really, to do it justice, I would almost call him a hierophant. That is a revealer of the of uh, a revealer of the Brahman, since uh, very often 
what the texts say is not that he creates a Brahman creates a Brahman, uh, but they often say something like they took a Brahman and made it Shrutriya or something fit to be heard. Uh, so the idea that the Brahman is not actually the physical sound, but the idea of a poem. Um, anyway, the point is the accent shift is one of the ways of creating this derivative. So we're used to words making derivatives maybe most commonly with like a ya extension. So Brahmanya, Brahman-like or worthy of a Brahman, right? Take your ya, add it to the ya, to the word. Now you have a derivative. Um, but there was evidently another way, and that was accent shift. This is not a very product, this is not a productive rule in the Vedas, but sometimes it's something you have to deal with. Also, there are other things that the accent tells you. Verbs in main clauses do not have accents. So if you see an accent on a verb, it means it's a verb in a subjoined clause. Vocatives do not have accents, which means Veda, the Vedic language has the only way of determining if something is a nominative plural mm. or a mm. or a vocative plural because of the presence of the accent. So people think, oh, the Vedas are <clears throat> going to be so hard. Actually, mm. the accent is just a tool that makes it easier for you. Yeah, yeah. It, in some ways, um, it look, looks like it gives it more precision in certain, that's right. in certain cases. Uh, the other thing the accent sometimes does, I mean, it does a lot of things, but uh, yeah. if you have a situation, I'll use this. If you have a compound X, Y, and the accents on the first member, usually this means it's a bahuvrihi. Hmm. Whereas if you have an accent on the second member, usually it's not a bahuvrihi. <laughs> that's not that's, always a hundred percent. That's very helpful. True. But it's very helpful, right? Because if you're a Rajaputra, you are one whose son is king. You're yeah. the father of a king. But if you're Raja Putra, hmm. then you are the son of the king. Now we can tell the difference thanks to the accent. So good news. Uh, in many ways, life is easier because of the Vedas. Mm -hmm. <laughs> in other ways, it's not so true, unfortunately, yeah. Uh, yeah. because we don't have lexicographers that predated the Vedas who can tell us what these words mean. So a lot of times we see a word, it shows up one time in the corpus, we have no idea what it means. Or we have to use our best inferences and and humbly guesstimate what we think this word means. I was going to ask about, about that, actually, like hmm? what for for students of Vedic, what's a good go to dictionary or source? I mean, how reliable is Monet Williams when we're looking at Vedic stuff? I mean, oftentimes, in fact, when we look at entries in Monet Williams, the first ones that come up are, are, are the Vedic um, sources. Monet Williams is in a good order. Unfortunately, yeah. it doesn't have good meanings. Yeah. Uh, similarly, the best dictionary for the Rig Veda is Grassmann's dictionary. However, Grassmann's dictionary does not also doesn't have great meanings. <laughs> that is, the semantics are, are out of date because it's like a centuries old. It's a century old dictionary. Right. Um, what's nice about Grassmann's is when it says what it thinks the word is, it will give you every attestation of its form. So what's nice about Grassmann's is you're like, hmm. I think this is the intensive participle of the root dr to break. And you can look it up in Grassmann's and, and Grassmann's going to be right about dr to break. But um, let's imagine that it's some, you know, you don't have to trust the semantic, but you at least know, hey, Grassmann also thinks this is a form of the intensive participle of dr to break. Yeah. So Grassmann's useful in that. The most up-to-date dictionary, not just for for all the Vedas, uh, is is uh, Meyerhofer's. So Meyerhofer is, you know, he, he created volume one, which was the first half of the alphabet. Volume two is the second half. And then volume three is for all the stuff he forgot. So with those three volumes. Is that in German? It's in German. Yeah. Mostly. And, yeah. you you know, if you want to do Vedic stuff, you're going to have to have a good grasp of dictionary German. You don't have to be an expert at German, but you need to know dictionary German, or at least get used to using Google Translate. There you um, go. So, yeah. <laughs> we'll, we'll get, I'm sure you'll get more into those nitty gritties and details about tools and resources and, and how to do that kind of stuff in the course. Uh, certainly. Well, that's, that's a good, um, <clears throat> of course, I'm sure there's many, many more interesting um, differences and similarities between Vedic and classical, but let's, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. Can you see that? I see Seth Powell started sharing his screen. Oh yes, I see it now. Okay, cool. Um, so yeah, so let's talk a little bit, uh, specifics of the course, Sanskrit 303, Vedic Sanskrit. It's going to run live July 10th through September 8th, 2023. This will be available for self-study, uh, after the fact. So if you are watching or listening to this, 
uh, and it's after September 8th, 2023, everything's been recorded and you can actually take this uh, on your own. Um, Tell us a little bit, Kaylee, about um, what students can expect, who this course is for. I know, you know, some students have been asking us, hey, I don't really have that much background. Is this sort of suited for me? And I think our understanding is you you really do need to have about one to two years, would you say, of of training in, in, in Sanskrit. To, to really succeed in this course. Of course, you're, you're, wel- you're all welcome to join and you can jump into the deep end, but I think to succeed, would you say you, you really do need to have some background? I mean, you, it is totally possible to start with Vedic, but not in this course, because this course, because of yeah. brevity, you know, yeah. brevity is the soul of wit and that's yeah. why I'm not very witty. I am long-winded, but in this case, um, I'm going to try and, basically give students in the first four courses the down low on how to use their classical knowledge to make a go of it at Vedic. Now, will it be exhaustive? No. And it can't be because the Vedas often do surprising things that defy individual rules. But there are lots of good tendencies where I can say, you know this about classical. In Vedas, you'll see this and this is why. If I wanted to do a zero to Vedas course, I would have to spend nine weeks on grammar because I'd have to teach you Sanskrit. So if we want to do the, if you want to, if you wanted to learn Vedic and not learn classical Sanskrit, uh, first of all, ask yourself why <laughs> you would want to cut out thousands of years of beautiful literature just to, just to get at this. I didn't have a choice. This is all they taught when I was an undergrad. Anyway, <laughs> um, but, <clears throat> but yeah, for the purposes of this course, for the sake of speed, I'm really going to use two classes to go over. Vedic morphology, verbal morphology, two for nominal morphology and, you know, accent stuff. Mm -hmm. Uh, And then we're going to start reading. And a lot of the things we read will be like, ah, I know you guys didn't figure out what this word is and we didn't talk about it, but that's because it only shows up here. And this will teach us this little principle of Vedas, right? So the the text selections are also um, selected in, in order to teach us things about Vedic grammar as we go. That's the sort of challenge of undertaking a wily you know, I mean, a, a, a wily corpus that knew no standardization, right? Mm, mm. Tell uh, us a little no, bit about what do students can expect to read. Again, obviously, we're, we're limited with time constraints. Um, that's right. So, uh, yeah, what part of uh, what I have in what I've sprinkled in the course are Vedic narratives about the origins of the Vedas. I find those interesting. And because they shift, they change, they're diverse. I think you should find those interesting too. Seth, you should update your Chrome. It's driving me crazy. Do it after. <laughs> what? Where? Oh, this? Yeah. No, okay. not now. <laughs> also, we're going to look at a couple narratives that don't have to do with Vedic origins, but they're important, what we might think of as mythological narratives. Um The importance of those narratives are not just in and of themselves, but these narratives in particular change a great deal over the Vedic period. We're going to look at some early Vedic prose, for example, and then we're going to look at earlier versions of these same narratives in the later, much harder Rig Vedic material. So one of the early Vedic prose stories we'll read at is a relationship between Yama and Yami, the first two humans. One of them will be about Sarama, the dog of Indra. Um, Then we're going to see older versions of those narratives, and we're going to wonder, why are they different? Can we, is this time alone change narratives or does the application of a story to do something change a narrative? We'll, we'll discuss and explore these things. The other reason I picked some of these things is because, for instance, um, one of our early Vedic prose passages, or sorry, our middle Vedic prose passages and module three is the story of Puruvas and Urvashi. I'm going to block out some of those parts because this is a middle Vedic prose commentary on a much harder Rig Vedic poem that you won't be ready for in module three. But what's interesting here is the story of Pururavas and Urvashi, for those of you who love the Mahabharata, we can, you can read it again in a different version of the Mahabharata. And of course, uh, the Vikramurvashiam by Kalidasa <coughs> is, a great, is a great play as well. Uh, this is evidently this narrative becomes the, the crux of revisitation. Sanskrit authors were compelled to revisit these stories and tweak them and change them over time. Um, for what reasons? Well, you, see, you can be the judge of that. Um, so essentially, we start with Vedic prose, and we will proceed to more complicated Vedic metrical things with more archaic language that will require uh, a little commentary. And then 
you'll be exposed to a, a number of types of hymns. We'll look at dialogue hymns, which are actually in general much easier than, uh, for instance, these speculative and riddle hymns. Now, some of these riddle hymns that I'll show you at the very end of the course, we might not know the answers to those riddles. You know, this is, as my T says, the unknown is where all outcomes are possible. And that's very true when it comes to studying the Vedas, because this was the oeuvre not just of one civilization, but of civilization after civilization, of a diverse group of people that span time and space in Northwest India. And their creative genius, as well as their political acumen, is baked into these texts. And that's not just one idea. It's a thousand ideas that change and grow. Their usage of words change and grow. Uh, I feel like I should actually, at that point, comment on the word yoga, which mm. usually in the Rig Veda just means summertime. But... Hmm. there's an yeah, important I had, point here. i had meant to ask you about that so i'm glad you yeah. brought it up and maybe this will be a good place to 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 close today yeah well that's the nature of semantic change right Ch words change meaning over time um and that's something that we get to wrestle with because words sometimes change meaning somewhat passively but they often change meaning through the active intellectual achievements of those who are re-articulating old ideas in new ways yoga being a, a, an important one of those um in essence why does why does yoga mean summertime in essence in the rig veda is is very simple the root yuj means to yoke it's hitching season it's when the you know when resources are scarce in the winter Vedic peoples often lived in arrangements of communal property ownership and habitation. They shifted to a more independent, spaced out, and private property model in the summer. So yoga is the hitching season. It's when they would spread out and often involve engaged in um, games of honor, that is, sport of cattle thieving and, and the like. Um, and when the clans reassembled in the winter, in Kshema, the peace season, the season of rest, they had to resolve those conflicts. Uh, it's likely from this notion that yoga as a season of, of trekking, of trial, becomes associated with the, I mean, I think, personally, associated with the this new intellectual project of being an ascetic who is on a trek away mm -hmm. from the shared community who is in a way isolated and independent like during yoga season when a clan goes off into the high grounds into the high mm. country to find forage for his cattle um this idea of a person on a trek of a yogin it may be the seed concept for someone who's out there doing yoga and i won't elaborate because it's a very it, that could just be hours and hours and courses and courses on its own but the important thing is this it was someone's project to say what you're doing out there, what you're doing on your own, whether it's meditation or self-mortification or deprivation, whether it's breath control, whatever you're doing, you're on a trek, man. <laughs> Just like we're on a trek. Every, you know, that was someone's, that was someone's oeuvre. That was someone's genius to liken those two things through metaphor. Mm. Mm. Uh, and that's in many ways the delight of the Veda, to see generations of people using their poetic creativity and genius to warp, change, bend, and reinvent language and their conceptual vocabulary um, in ways that we get to see firsthand that just look like they come ex nihilo if you start with classical. When you look at the Vedas, you can see a long history of ideas that are very exciting because of their incredible consequences in the later period. Well, wow, very fitting. Yesterday was the summer solstice and the official mark of summer. So it's huge season, and it's the season for Vedic Sanskrit at Yogic Studies. So couldn't be more fitting, and uh, what a great way to end what has been just a fascinating conversation. Kaylee, uh, I thank you for, for your time. Uh, we could have easily kept going for another hour, but I believe uh, you're in the process of moving, and we've got many things going on in the background. Lots of packing. <laughs> So good luck with your upcoming move. Maybe when we see you next, you might be in a different um, physical space there in the in the Zoom. I will room. definitely have more than one shirt available. <laughs> no, no worries. Uh, but uh, yes, thank you so much. Thanks uh, to all of our our listeners and 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 viewers uh, on YouTube and uh, who are listening to the podcast. Uh, feel free to comment um, or uh, ask any questions that you may have to, to Kaylee or about the course. But um, 
for those, if you stuck it out in this conversation for this long and you're still here, then come join us for Vedic Sanskrit this summer. It's going to be a lot of fun, and uh, I think you'll learn a lot. It's so my first final... pleasure to teach it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, yeah. Kaylee, it, you know, he, he really means that. He's, he's an extremely passionate and committed teacher, if you couldn't tell already from this conversation. So we're lucky to have him, and um, we're looking forward to the course. So thanks again, Kaylee. Thanks, Seth. uh, We'll talk soon.